You are listening to One Nation Under Crime, a historical, chronological true crime podcast. Each week, we go through our nation's history and discuss one case from each year starting in 1800. I'm Kayla. And I'm Leah. We have made it. Do you know what episode number this is? 30. Yes. We are out of our 20s. Out of them, much like myself now. Um, <laughs> you're old. <laughs> Not as old as you. Well, um, you know. Yes, this year was my 30th birthday. Um, but yes, we have officially made it to episode 30. Three zero. Three zero. Woohoo! We got, it's been, an, it's been a monumental week. We got our first one star rating on Apple Podcasts. Wah, wah. And I mean, whatever. Um, <laughs> whatever. I mean, it's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it. Um, we, we have reached another milestone. Yes. We, I mean, you it's know, a it's of, part of it. It's a rite of passage for podcasters, honestly. It just, you know, you get, you get the bad along with the good. It's just one of those things. It happens. There's always one. It's all good. There is always one. So we're, we're still here. But if you would like to go give us a five-star review, please do. Uh, five stars only. I, I've ha- Clearly, I've not said my thing I in mean, a while. Five or nothing. Five stars only. Nothing less than five stars. If you have nothing nice to say or nothing nice to rate, then don't say anything at all. I mean, all. have you not seen Bambi people? Uh, right. I mean, come on. You, you know these things. <sighs> so we have made it to episode 30, and we are in the year 1828. Um, this episode this week is got some twists and turns, so it's pretty interesting. Um, also, our bonus episode bonus came out last week for uh, those of you who did listen to it. I hope y'all enjoyed it. Yes. So a pretty good bit of people have downloaded it so far. Good. So um, hopefully that was a nice little surprise for you if you didn't know about it. And like I said, then we're going to do one episode kind of like each week. There's going to be a bonus episode that comes out uh, about a historical topic or an event or really anything that's interesting. So and the name is ingenious. Yes, it is called USBS, where we talk about the BS of the U.S. So, ah, ah, ah. always a fun time. And uh, so, yeah, go listen to that if you haven't already. Um, and then you'll have another episode coming out in a couple of days. I mean, I mean, we're givers. Givers. What can we say? Givers all around. We're humble. I mean, givers. It, it, what... What could you have to one star about? I'm, I, I mean, mean, right? Whatever. So we're beautiful. All right. I mean, we're givers. It we're just, hilarious. We're knowledgeable. It just is, I suppose. Humble. <laughs> Did I leave anything out? I don't think so. Okay. Um, our sources <laughs> this week, uh, before we get into it, our sources this week, the always, always helpful executedtoday.com. Executed today. Which is what, which is funny that this, anyways, it's funny that this one is on executed today because he was not executed. Interesting. Yes. So, and then, um, I got a, well, it's kind of like a historical paper that someone wrote. Um, it was published by the Kentucky Historical Society. So we are back in Kentucky and I was somebody executed. I'm confused now. You'll see. And so this was from JSTOR.org. I am now a member of that um, because of like libraries and COVID and stuff have been closed. Like card carrying member? Not really like a card carrying member, but because it's, it's kind of how you find like, jur- like I said before, like journals or papers or things that people yes. like research that people have done. And a lot of it you can't access um, unless you ha- like are part of a college. Gotcha. So because of COVID, they let researchers have um, access. Gotcha, so gotcha. I am now now a member of JS. So you don't have to have a card. No. So it is. Showing my age. <laughs> <laughs> so our events from 1828 to January 8th, the Democratic Party was established officially. At this time, we did already have kind of Two part, we had Democratic Republicans, and we've had different things throughout this time. So, Federalists, all the, you know. Mm -hmm. So, 
February 19th, the Boston Society for Medical Improvement was established. Oh. February 21st, the Cherokee Phoenix is the first newspaper published by Native Americans in the United States and in one of their indigenous languages. Interesting. The Cherokee tribe. March 24th, the Philadelphia and Columbia Railway was authorized, and this was the first state-owned railway. So all of the others have been kind of like a company. Private and yeah, a private owned. company. Yeah. April 4th. Now, keep in mind, this did happen in Amsterdam. It's on here for a reason. So I'm very well aware this was not the U.S. But again, just like some other things that I found, this was another invention that people needed to know about. Okay. Kasparis Van Wooden. That's a fun name. Patented chocolate milk powder. I mean, where would we be right? without chocolate milk powder? Um, and he is from Amsterdam. So, Netherlands. Uh, but chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> April 14th, Noah Webster registered a copyright mm. for the publication of the first American dictionary of the English language. May 8th. The American Peace Society was formed in opposition to war, militarism, or violence. Right? All right. May 19th, the tariff of 1828 was enacted. Critics named it the Tariff of Abominations because they saw it as unfairly protective of northern industry to the disadvantage of the southern economy. It set a tax on, quote, imported goods from the South that were anywhere from 38 to 45 percent of a tax oh. for anything that was coming from the South to the North. Wow. Specifically, not the other way around. So that's why it was called the Tariff of Abominations. Well. On July 4th, the construction of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad commenced with the first cornerstone laid by Charles Carroll. August 11th, the Working Men's Party was founded in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It is the first, quote, worker-oriented political party in the U.S. The party began due to the growing concerns of craftsmen and skilled workers of the lower socioeconomic class. They were called the Workies, and <laughs> they... Sorry. <laughs> that just made me laugh. They, um... I'm with the workies. <laughs> they press for equal educational opportunities, so free public education instead of having to pay for school. Faith in the LRE. Oh, sorry. I went back <laughs> to my school days. I apologize. <laughs> and they also press for, uh, they were against forced service in the militia, which we kind of still have today. You have to register for the draft if you're a male um, in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, they and you're eight, I mean, in age 18. Yeah, you have to be 18. Mm -hmm. Um so they demanded they demanded the ten hour workday instead of fourteen or whatever hours. Whoa. They wanted the abolition of imprisonment for debt and an effective mechanics lien law for laborers on buildings. This law would specifically prevent the seizure of a craftsman's tools as a security for a debt. But I mean, here's the thing. That makes sense because, mm -hmm. number one, if you take a craftsman's tools, how's he going to work off his debt, To pay one? you. I mean. And that's the reason you took on And then, number two, if you put a debtor into prison mm -hmm. for a debt, how's he going to work to pay off his debt? So, I exactly. mean, those make sense. Those do make sense to me. And that, that was what I was thinking, too. Um October 27th, gold was first discovered by Benjamin Parks near Cherokee First Nation land in Lumpkin County, Georgia. Lumpkin. It was technically <gasps> the first gold rush. You know what? Hmm. I taught at a school and there was a guy whose last name was Lumpkin. Interesting. Fun I fact. I don't know how I feel about the last name, but. Well, it just hit me. Just the name. And Bam. Name. So. <laughs> December 3rd, current President John Quincy Adams lost his re-election to Andrew Jackson. Wah, wah. Undated events from 1828, the House of Representatives election increased the majority of the Jacksonian Democrats. Jacksonian. Jacksonian. Uh, 
Um, A History of the Life and Voyages of Christopher Columbus, a novel by Washington Irving, was published and popularized the common misconception that Europeans thought the Earth was flat prior to the explorations of Columbus. Not saying that that's all that was in there. I'm not really sure what all it was, but... That's a brief synopsis. There you go. Two minor political parties were formed. Uh, the single issue anti-Masonic party, which we did talk about, mm-hmm. um, and that was in upstate New York. And the nullifier party, which advocated states' rights in opposition to the tariff of abominations. So that was the whole reason that that party started was because of that tariff. I mean, I have to say, I really like the name of the tariff. <laughs> it's a fun one. I mean, um, it kind of is. So a ring spinning machine was developed in the United States. Ring spinning is a method of spinning fibers like cotton, flax, or wool to make mm. yarn. And then the last undated event from 1828, John Neal published Rachel Dyer, the first hardcover novelized version of the Salem Witch Trials. I knew that name sounded familiar. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Our births in 1828, June 2nd, we have James Cutler Dunn Parker. Very long name. It is a long name. (laughs) He was an organist and a composer. He was a Gemini. August 6th, Andrew Taylor Still. Very, very interesting person um, that most people wouldn't know about. Um, He is considered the father of osteopathy, and he was a Civil War surgeon. Osteopathy is a type of alternative medicine that emphasizes physical manipulation of the body, muscle tissues, and bones, um, not a chiropractor. Okay. There is a difference uh, because it deals with different physical manipulations for muscles as well. From everything, there's a whole thing. People want to say that osteopathy isn't a, shouldn't be a doctor. There's a whole thing. Like when you go... To the page on Wikipedia where it talks about osteopathy at the very top, it says in like in like a banner, it says, please know that osteopathy is under investigation on this page to see if it's like a legit medical field. Oh my. And it is. But it's like somebody got mad. Like so, oh, no. somebody went on there and was like, uh, no. Um, but He's the one who started all of it. August. So we blame him for the fight on Wikipedia. Right. Okay. Um, he was a Leo, by the way. Um, August 18th, William A. Hammond was born. He was a military physician and neurologist, and he is the 11th Surgeon General of the U.S. Army. Hmm. Uh, for those who aren't aware, we still have the Surgeon General of the Army today. And the Surgeon General's main duty is to provide access and assistance on all health care matters pertaining to the U.S. Army and its military health system. Uh, he was also Leo. Let's see. November 17th, Milton Wright was born. He is a bishop of the United Brethren Church and father of the Wright brothers. Oh. He's a Scorpio. And for those who don't know, uh, we'll, we'll get to the Wright brothers. We'll definitely talk about them. We might do um, a USBS episode for the Wright Brothers. Um, he's the father of the fathers of flight. Yes, he's the father of the fathers of flight. Grandfather of flight. <gasps> mm-hmm. So our deaths in 1828. So we have some interesting deaths this year. Oh, dear. They tie back. To two of these deaths tie back to previous cases that we have discussed. And I just thought that it was interesting that they fell here. So March 25th, Mariah Reynolds died. Oh, Most, Mariah Reynolds entered mm-hmm. my life. Most uh, know Mariah as the mistress of Alexander Hamilton, and she was the main topic of the Reynolds pamphlet that came out. Have you seen, read this? I Something know. Something like that. <laughs> Sorry, I got excited. I lost my mind. June 6th. This is the other one that ties back. John Kinsey, fur trader and the man responsible <gasps> for the first murder in Chicago, died. Mm. Mm-hmm. 
And then this was very interesting. Uh, December 22nd. Remember that I said Andrew Jackson was just elected? Mm -hmm. Rachel Jackson died on December 22nd before he was inaugurated. She was the wife of Andrew Jackson, who was just elected as president. And this made Andrew Jackson the second widower in office. And his niece, Emily, handled the hostessing duties of the first lady during the first years of his presidency. The other, um, the first widower was Thomas Jefferson and his daughter, Martha, who went by Patsy, um, took over first lady duties. But Thomas Jefferson was the first widower in office. And then Andrew Jackson was the second. Hmm. I just thought that was it. Cause I've always wondered that, like we've not had a single president, like that's been, they've yeah. always been married to someone. And so that was, and I've often, I've often thought of that, but anyways, and then just to think like two of them were widowers was just interesting. Yeah. Just very interesting. Um, so I, you know, cause I've always wondered how, how does that work? Cause I know the first lady has her duties that she needs to do, you know, like there's a lot of different things specifically that she is responsible for mm -hmm. a lot of philanthropy, a lot of different things like that. Of course, hosting people at the white house, you know, a lot of different things. Decorating and, the white house for Christmas. I mean, one of the most important things. I know honestly. it's not, but I'm just saying. right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I've, I just wondered like, what if they died, but both of them had daughters. And so, uh, or, no, Andrew Jackson um, had a niece. It was his niece. And then uh, Thomas Jefferson, it was his daughter. Well, I will say, you know, I love some cheesy Hallmark and Hallmark like movies mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. that's just. We just turned them on a moment ago. We did. We did. I, and I just love them. There's, the, let me, okay. Go, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so there was one, I think it was on Hulu. I don't remember, mm -hmm. but it was called uh, First Lady. Mm hmm. And it was about um, the this lady was first the first lady. Mm -hmm. Her husband died, and mm -hmm. the vice president was sworn in. But mm -hmm. then he was running for a second term, and she ran with him, like they ran mm. together. And she ran as his first lady. Mm. It was very interesting. interesting. And they talked about his niece, how she, and that mm -hmm. was where they kind of got the idea. Like she ran the white, you know, she mm -hmm. she did the first lady mm -hmm. position. And did it beautifully, and you know she already this first lady already, right, knew, already knew what to do. It's so very, it's it, very interesting. It's a very interesting concept. And then um, because, it was a unique movie too, a unique yeah, that idea. is a unique idea. Um, because that is very interesting as to what 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 happens in that role. Well, it's an important role. And then well, and then too, not to like get into anything specific, but. Had we had a first female president, which we haven't had an official first female president, we have a vice president right now. Well, we had a female president for a couple of hours. For a couple of hours for a colonoscopy. Um, but my qu my question is, would the duties of mm. the first man change because... and? and because he's a man. Yeah, and that's a good question. Or would they still remain the same? Because we know how, you know... Things are viewed as far as that goes. And so the first lady's mm. position typically is more of the feminine side. More of the hostess. The hostess and, side. And, you know, the, the greeting and, and mm -hmm. making sure everyone feels right. at home. And, I mean, it's more than that. Right. But that it is, is a large right. part of it. Right. That's that is, what most people see is right. that portion of it. And right. so that's what I wonder is if we did have a first man, if the duties would change and if some of those first lady duties would actually go to the president mm. and if they did would other things come off of the president mm. so that she would take on first lady duties very interesting because we've never had one that is a very interesting thought you know because i mean men i, I mean Traditionally, not currently, but a lot of men, they don't care how the White House is decorated. Like, They're just husband, like, it's red and green. Cool. <laughs> yeah. My husband would be like, just put just, a tree if yeah, you want fine. a tree. I, I don't <laughs> care. What do you mean we have to have 73 trees? Yeah. That'd be. <laughs> yeah, it looks great. <laughs> That'd be the barest Christmas that the White right? House has ever seen. <laughs> I don't know. Put up whatever you want. 
<laughs> just don't spend over X amount. That's what my husband would care about. Yeah. He'd be like, look, this is the budget. If my, Make it work. If my boyfriend, yeah, my boyfriend, uh, he would not at all, at all, at all. It would be, he would have a Charlie Brown Christmas tree and be like, <laughs> this, this is it. Um, but yeah, I've always wondered that. Like, because I, I think of just weird off topic things like that. Just like, what well, is, and is there anything in place that states what would happen in mm. that instance? I'm sure not because exactly. I mean, because it's not been, I mean, Hillary ran during the last Hillary Clinton um, ran during not this past election cycle, but the election cycle mm. before. So technically, technically there should be something first, in place. Right. But our first man would have also been president. Mm. So that would have been very interesting, too, to see. Sure. Because he's already done the job. Well, I mean. He's already. They've already oh, both Bill. been in. Right. They've already both the been White in the White House. House. So, so he could, it could have just been, hey, just do it mm-hmm. like it was. You know? Mm-hmm. That's that was my question as to what. Because so for any people who have ever watched Scandal. It was a show that was on for a really long time. It's a Shonda Rhimes original. Mm-hmm. It is phenomenal. And what happens in it, like, sorry, no spoilers, guys. This show, it went off like five years ago. Um, It's a very, very good show, though. And if you've not watched it, I highly recommend it. But in that show, the first lady ends up running for president. And she won. You know, I never watched it. And she divorced her husband. Like she, yeah, yeah. Because she found out her husband was cheating on her. Well, I mean. And so she, uh, so it's very interesting because I, you know, I've always wondered. And then if there isn't a first lady and there isn't a niece to take over or there isn't, what happens then? Who does it fall to? Yeah. It's just very interesting to think of how those things could happen. Um, That's how my brain works. Um, (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> There's a peek into the craziness that is Kayla's yeah. mind. You're welcome. And and what's bad is verbalizing it takes me longer than it did to think of it. <laughs> <laughs> like I thought of it really quickly and then I had to work through in my head how to explain it. <laughs> because that's just how my like my brain just goes a thousand miles a minute. Um so We are going to get on to our case this week. August 13th of 1828, Isaac Bledsoe Desha died while incarcerated in San Felipe de Austin, Texas. Desha was waiting on his trial to start for the murder of Thomas Early. Now, I said there are twists and turns. And oh boy, are there some interesting things that go on. So we'll get into it, of course, but we are back in Kentucky. We were just in Kentucky a little bit ago as well. With bourbon. And yeah, so I, just, I don't really can't, drink bourbon. Can't I can't like discuss to say bourbon that. now. So, but anyways, uh, we are in Maysville, Kentucky to begin with. I know that I said in the other that he died while he was incarcerated in San Felipe, Austin. Uh, it's San Felipe de Austin, Texas. Um, he was incarcerated there when he died, but our story starts and the main parts of our story take place in Maysville, Kentucky. So we're going to travel. Yes. Oh, there's a lot. So Maysville is located in Mason County in the northeast area of the Commonwealth of Kentucky and the county borders Ohio. The city is located on the Ohio River and is 66 miles northeast of Lexington. We talked about Lexington Mm -hmm. in our bonus episode, uh, the Battle of Lexington and Concord, Um, or the Battles. Um, The geographic area is known as the Outer Bluegrass Region. The region of the state is characterized by underlying fossil ferrous limestone, dolomite, highly fertile soil, and the center of breeding quality livestock, most importantly, because this is Kentucky, thoroughbred racehorses. So that area is very well known for uh, breeding quality livestock, including horses. Yes. Big horses. Um, Simon Kenton 
made the first settlement in the area in 1775. By 1786, John May had acquired the land, and Daniel Boone (gasps) established a trading post and tavern in the area. The main exports for the area were, of course, bourbon, Mm -hmm. hemp, and tobacco. By 1787, the settlement was incorporated as Maysville. The town was known for its manufacturing of wrought iron. Fun fact, the iron was sent downriver to Cincinnati, Ohio, and New Orleans, Louisiana. Most of the ironwork in these towns came from Maysville. So when you go to New Orleans and you see all the ironwork, a lot of that iron came from Maysville. Huh. That's where it was made. So that was interesting. That is interesting. I wouldn't think that it would take, it would be that uh, far away. Right. That seems like a, a pretty big distance, but... Whatever. Now we know. That's how they do things. Uh, Later in the 20th century, Henry Means Walker made the town home to one of the largest tobacco auction warehouses in the world. Hmm. One of the largest contributions the town had was being one of the most important stops on the Underground Railroad. Oh. Since Ohio was a free state, and actually in our next episode, we will actually discuss the Underground Railroad. Oh, goody. No. A lot. Not good. Um, it's not good. Uh, oh. We we discuss. We'll get there, but just know it's coming in the next episode. I know we haven't talked about it yet because we haven't had anything that's been like directly related to it. But we will go through the Underground Railroad. We'll discuss kind of um, how they communicated, how a lot of things go. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's nothing. I'll I'll go ahead and say this. It's nothing bad specifically to the Underground Railroad. Okay. It's something else that happens that I have to explain what the Underground okay. Railroad was. Because the Underground Railroad is a um, good thing. Yes. And, and we'll find out the opposite sides of that as well. Okay. Um, so it, it, it is an interesting episode. We will talk about it a lot in that episode. So just to let y'all know, I know we haven't discussed it yet. We're getting there. Um, But like I said, since Ohio was a free state, Maysville was the perfect place for slaves to shelter for a long time before going across the Ohio River to freedom. Famous abolitionist Harriet Beecher Stowe briefly visited in 1833 and watched a slave auction in front of the courthouse in Washington, which was the original seat of the county and now labeled a historic district of Maysville. Stowe included the scene she witnessed in her novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was published in 1850. Some notable people from the area uh, include Ted Berry, who was the first black mayor of Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, Nick Clooney, journalist, TV host, and father of George Clooney. Hmm. And Thornton Blackburn. He is a former slave whose case in the Canadian courts established the principle that Canada would not return slaves to their, quote, masters, and thus was the safe terminus of the Underground Railroad. So it was his case that made it to where Canada said, even if you were not free, per se, we are not sending you back. Like you, this is a safe place to come. Good decision. Yes. And so that was why um, this town was so important because Kentucky was still, you know, a slave state at this point. And so where Maysville was, it was right on the Ohio river and Ohio was a free state. So you just hopped it, you know, you went across the river to Ohio and you were in a free state. Now that didn't prevent other things from happening. And we'll discuss that. Like I said, in our next episode, but Thornton Blackburn is the reason why Canada became a safe haven. So that was very interesting. That is pretty cool. Isaac Bledsoe Desha was born on January 1st of 1802 in Maysville, Kentucky to Margaret Bledsoe and Joseph Desha. So that's how he got his name. Mom's maiden name is his middle name. Uh, Isaac was named after his grandfather and... He was one of 13 children. And before you even ask, yes, that is beyond too many children. That's a lot of children. Beyond. They they all survived infanthood. Like, I mean, I know Mm. that. It didn't say anything about it, but, you know, whether that. And it also, I also could not find a definitive number for what order he was in. Like Mm. what, because he was born in 1802. And I want to say his parents 
were married. I didn't write it down, but I want to say his parents were only married in like 1795. So they had only Ooh. been married for like seven years. So I don't know what number like, he was. Was he seven of 13? Yeah. Was, was he... he 13 of 13? Like, well, I mean, well, he wasn't because he has a brother. We'll talk about him too, but <sighs> 13. I, I can't. Um, that's a lot of kids. That's a lot of kids. Isaac was described as a, quote, likable boy and presented a generous and amiable disposition. Do you know what the name Isaac means? Go for it. Laughter. That is a good name. Mm-hmm. By 1817, he had been attending school for a while when he decided he was going to apprentice as a tanner with a man named Archibald Logan. Isaac apprenticed for him for five years. While Isaac worked for Logan, he was a, quote, sober, industrious, and morally upright young man. Sounds like a happy story. (sighs) It it takes a turn. Oh, dear. (laughs) For those of you who are not aware of exactly what tanning is, um, I just thought that this was kind of interesting uh, for a couple of reasons. We'll get into it. You'll find one of these fun facts interesting. I do enjoy a fun fact. (laughs) Uh, Tanning is the process of treating uh, the skins and hides of animals to produce leather. Tanning hide into leather involves a process that permanently alters the protein structure of the skin, making it more durable and less susceptible to decomposition. This process can also include coloring the hide. Um during that entire process as well to get the color down into it before the tanning process can begin like sorry guys if this is not something you want to hear about but it's nothing about animals specifically it's just what they do after they get the skin so um they are de-haired degreased desalted and soaked in water anywhere between six hours and two days the name of tanning actually came from the use of tannin in this process tannin is an acidic chemical compound that is derived from the bark of certain trees around the time of this story an alternative method was used which was called chrome tanning where chromium salts were used instead of natural tannins and for any wine connoisseurs listening the tannins found in these trees that they used for tanning are the same tannins you would find in wine Interesting. Tannins actually are a chemical compound that protect plants from predators. So when you are drinking wine, it is actually trying to still defend itself from beyond the grave. Because so some people are allergic to like mm-hmm. I'm allergic to tannins. Like I, I get bad, bad headaches. You know, they've made the little yeah, the things thing you can put mm-hmm. in and get the tannins out. So, uh, so yeah, um, it's actually trying to still defend itself. From beyond the grave. By November <laughs> Beyond of, the grave. Beyond the grave. Um, or beyond the grove, technically. Ha, 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 You're ha, welcome. Ha. Um, be here all week. <laughs> By November of 1823, Isaac found himself a wife in Cornelia Pickett. Cornelia. Cornelia. Bless. The couple met through Isaac's sister, Ellen, who was married to Cornelia's brother. Okay, Dan. So their kids would be double first cousins. <clears throat> we'll get into Cornelia. Uh-oh. To get into the full story of Isaac and how he is relevant to crime, we have to discuss his father, Joseph Desha. Isaac's father built the first brick house in the county on his estate, which was roughly 500 acres. Just a casual 500 acres. Just a couple. Uh, Joseph served in the War of 1812 and was a major general of the Kentucky militia. He also served as a member of both branches of the Kentucky legislature and as a representative to Congress for six terms. So he was kind of important. Oh, he gets more important than that. The year after his son's marriage in 1824, Joseph was elected the governor of Kentucky. Uh oh. Mm hmm. The crux of the election was whether or not relief should be provided for the state's lower class that was still feeling the effects of the Panic of 1819. We did discuss this, and just to refresh everyone's memory, in 1818, gold and silver had been taken out of circulation, and they were replaced with paper currency that was issued by independent banks of the state. Inflation and chaos ensued, 
And this was when the banks suddenly came back and said, JK, all that money that we loaned you, we need back now. Mm. Um, And clearly they were like, we borrowed the money from you. So we don't have it. (laughs) Um, Oops. Nope. Uh, During the election, the voters were split between two naturally formed parties. One was called the Relief Party, who supported laws favorable to those in debt, and the Anti-Relief Party, who supported laws that protected the creditors. Joseph was in the Relief Party. After Joseph was elected, relief legislators who held majorities in both houses of the General Assembly attempted to remove the offending judges from office. Well, they didn't achieve this, and uh, they didn't get the two-thirds majority vote to do that. The legislature passed a Reorganization Act abolishing the Court of Appeals and replacing it with a new court. So basically, they said, we couldn't get the judges out that we don't like, so we're just going to create a whole other court system. Oh. Yeah. Kind of like, oh, mom said, no, let's go ask dad. Yeah, let's go ask dad. Um, Well... The original court continued to claim authority as the court, <laughs> as the court of last resort. In Mom the says, "I said what I said." Um, during what became known as the old court, new court controversy, both courts operated simultaneously with both claiming legitimacy. Oh no! <laughs> there were two major controversies that challenged Joseph's role as governor for Kentucky. One of them was his role in removing Horace Holly as the president of Transylvania University. I'm sorry. Transylvania. Yes, you heard me correctly. There That's was a Transylvania University. That, I know. Not I mean, the actual Transylvania. But please but tell me like, that their mascot was a bat. I don't know. Oh, my god! They gosh. didn't have mascots at this time, I'm sure. <sighs> um, religious cons- Missed opportunity. <laughs> Religious conservatives wanted uh, Horace Holly out because they viewed him too liberal. But Joseph had other reasons to get rid of him. Was... Yep. So Horace Holly was friends with Henry Clay. And if that name sounds familiar, it's because he was currently the Secretary of State under John Quincy Adams. Well... Joseph saw Henry Clay as a political enemy and thought that hurting Clay's friend would inadvertently hurt Clay as well. The second controversy involves his son, Isaac. Uh Uh-oh. In the same year that his father was elected as governor of the state, keep in mind, his dad was elected in 1824, right? Right, 1824. He married in 1823. Uh-huh. In the same year that his father was elected, 1824, just just refreshing people's memory, that is one year later. Uh-huh. Just, I mean, in case you weren't aware, it was one year later. Uh, well, in that time, he was still floating in wedded bliss. You would think, but that is not what happened. I was trying. Isaac separated from his wife. Oh, no. Cornelia was apparently terrified of her husband of only a year. Isaac was staying in Richard Dodgett's cabin road, nope, roadside tavern on the border of Fleming County. November 2nd of 1824, Isaac woke up and ate breakfast at the tavern. He was joined by eight other men, and one of them was named Francis Baker. Baker was the editor of the Mississippian newspaper in Natchez, Mississippi, and he was traveling to Trenton, New Jersey to get married. During breakfast, Baker mentioned that he wanted to visit a friend in the area named Captain John Bickley. Interesting last name, Bickley. Hmm. Isaac knew where Captain Bickley lived, and since Isaac was heading in that direction already, he could show Baker where to stop along the way. Like, you know, we're going the same way anyways. I'll show you where it is. I got you, bro. You would think. Okay, cool. Well, the two men left the tavern around 8 a.m. to head in the direction of Maysville, Kentucky. Isaac was on his bed. This this does become important. Isaac was on his bay mare, which is your typical horse that you think of. It's like the chestnut brown with Mm -hmm. the black mane. Like what you normally would think of is like that's 
unless you think of an all brown horse. Usually it's the black mane and like the chestnut brown colors. That is what is called a bay mare. Correct. And it's a mare, so it's a, it's a female horse. Um, and Baker was on a gray mare with two saddlebags. It's kind of self-explanatory of what a gray mare is. However, it can be very confusing if you know what dapple color. is. I was going to say, was it a dapple gray? Because that's my favorite. I don't know if it was a dapple gray. They just said that it was a gray mare. But the types of horses are important because Baker's horse was very recognizable. Because at this time, yes. gray horses were not common. Right. So he had already received a lot of attention while he was traveling from Mississippi. Sure, because it was a pretty horse, I'm Gorgeous sure. Horse. Gorgeous. Um, a lot of times, for people who don't know, a lot of times gray horses will also appear white. Sure. Because their skin is what is actually dark, not their fur. There you go. Fur. It's not, I don't feel like it's fur. Their hair. Um, it, yeah. It's more hair. It's, <laughs> um, so, yes, the horses become very important. The two men set off for their destinations, but they never stopped at Captain Bickley's home. Uh-oh. Around 10 a.m., one of Isaac's neighbors noticed a gray mare wandering around without a rider, but still rigged with a bridle and saddle. Now, if y'all recall... But no saddlebags. If y'all recall... We talked about this in our Dominic Daly and James Halligan case when they had saw the horse just wandering. Yeah. Um, this was the case, for those who don't remember, where the innocent Irishmen mm -hmm. were hanged and later found out it was the witnesses, like, uncle who did it. Anyways, mm -hmm. I digress. Uh, but no one who was worth anything, like, as a horse owner would leave tack, and that's what that's called for those who aren't aware, who would leave tack on their horse and just let their horse roam around right. in it. Like, that's not a thing. Uh, the reins the reins could get caught up under her feet. She could fall. Or they could get caught in a tree, and she might not be able to get free from it if she were in danger. Then you have all the other pieces that can get caught on any number of things and can cause major damage to the horse if anything were to happen. Remember, at this time... Horses were the main mode of transportation and source of labors on farms, so you would not put a horse in jeopardy because they're your right. livelihood. Yeah, I mean they're they're your most mm -hmm. expensive mm -hmm. piece of so your most expensive um, I possession. Mean, yeah, and piece of equipment because yeah. quite literally you use that horse for right, everything. Right, and so that's why when this person saw a horse wandering around with stuff on it, it's like something's, something's wrong. Something's happened. Yeah. This is not good. The neighbor caught the gray mare and rode her up the road to see if he could find the rider in case the rider fell off and was injured and needed help. Which is what you would think. Obviously. Instead, the neighbor came upon Isaac's horse and she had on a saddle but no bridle. So the mm. bridle, for those, it goes around their head. Um, usually it has a bit on it which goes in their mouth for the reins and everything, but she had a saddle on and no bridle, which is very odd. Um, not to mention the blood that was on oh, her neck and her no. withers, which withers on a horse are at the base of the horse's neck in between the shoulder blades. Think of it as if you're riding on a horse, it's in front of the saddle horn. Yeah. That's their withers. Like if you look, look, mm -hmm. down, look down in front of, yeah. That's their withers. So she had blood all down her neck and on her withers. Suspicious. A little bit, a little bit. The neighbor got his brother to take the horse to Isaac's home in case she got out. But when the brother arrived at Isaac's home, no one was there. So he left the horse on Isaac's property, obviously taking off the saddle and making sure she was safe like a good horse owner would. Sure. Um, and went back to his brother and the gray mare. It wasn't long that the two men and the mare ran into Isaac walking down the road carrying two saddlebags hmm, the ones that i asked about mm -hmm. that weren't on the gray mm -hmm. mare mm. Okay. okay isaac identified the horse and said he just accepted the horse as payment from a man who owed him money <gasps> oh it's convenient all this can be explained why of course isaac never mentioned how the two horses seemed to get away from him and he was never asked where the blood came from on his horse um isaac mounted the gray horse and went home 
The same day, Isaac arrived at the tannery shop, and when he was asked what was wrong, he just said that he had been kicked by a horse and in a totally unrelated incident, he cut his finger, almost removing it. Um, oh. To- two totally different instances, kicked by a horse, then injuring his hand. Two totally, totally different. Totally separate. I mean, just what a day. Different. Um, what a day, what a day. Crazy things happen. Eventually, people put two and two together. With Isaac injured and Baker missing, the suspicions of what happened to Baker were all put on Isaac. Some people are smarter than you think. You know, you got to be smarter than the average bear. That's what I always say. Mm. Um, Remember how I said that Cornelia was going to leave Isaac and that's why he was staying at the tavern? And she was scared of him? And remember how I said there was no one at the house? Yeah. Well, Isaac's mood continued to drastically shift, and Cornelia, who was pregnant at the time, oh. moved out of the couple's home and refused to return. <gasps> she later gave birth to their daughter, and she never returned to Isaac, and he never met his daughter. That is very sad. It might have been the best thing to happen to Cornelia. Well, I mean, yes, but just that, that is yes, very that sad. that is a sad situation. Um, over the next week, items were found along the roadway between the tavern and Maysville. Which is weird. Um, what, what kind of items? A bloody glove. Oh. A pair of saddlebags with the bottom cut out. And Isaac's missing horse bridle. Weird. Then on November 8th, Three men found a man's body half covered by a log around 50 yards off the road. Hmm. These men, let me tell you, ahead of their time, these men, because they did not touch anything. Ooh. Not that that mattered back then, but now, if you ever come <laughs> upon a crime scene, don't touch anything. You know, just don't, don't call, move the body. No, don't touch anything. Just go, go get someone. Um, and so that's what they did. They alert, alerted the local authorities who came and recovered the body. Here's a bit of a trigger warning as because we are going to discuss what happened uh, physically to him. It's not great. Obviously, it's a murder, but it's not completely. Uh, I don't know how to explain it. It's not extremely gory. Or She's going to let me hear it. Yes. So um, I'm going to start that in a second. So skip now. Um, the body had been partially stripped of clothing and the area that it was found was right around the spot that Isaac's neighbor had seen him walking the day the horses were loose. The body had been beaten with a blunt object, roughly four to five times bludgeoning his head. This is, sorry guys, this is the really, really bad part. His throat had been slit deeply and severed his windpipe. Lastly, he had very unusual stab wounds that were square shaped. He was only wearing a shirt, socks, and a single glove. Yeah, Lee's looking at me. Once the authorities searched the area, they found pantaloons, a coat, several changes of clothes, several pieces of paper with the name Baker written on them, a hat, a horse bridle, a wallet suspiciously similar to Isaac's. Um, and a riding whip with a heavy handle that was very similar to Isaac's that he usually had with his horse. Weird. It also turned out that Isaac carried around a dagger with him that matched the unusual marks on the victim's body. Remember those square shaped marks? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Weirdly enough, matches. So, how does a dagger make a square shaped mark? I think it was the hilt the of hilt it. The hilt of it. Okay, mm-hmm. that makes more sense. I was thinking a square. <laughs> yeah. Shape. Dagger. Um, once the body was brought, which I wonder if that's how he om- almost cut his finger off because mm. he was holding it from the wrong end. Um, so once the body was brought back to town, Captain Bickley positively identified the body as Francis Baker. The circumstantial evidence against Isaac kept piling up. Especially when people figured out that Isaac had the gray mare and he was claiming it was his. Then there was the, quote, new gold watch Isaac was wearing, the new clothes he was wearing, and a bit of money that Isaac all of a sudden had, and people took notice. How do you explain all of these things? 
most notable being how do you explain that you now have this horse, right? Isaac, please. Isaac said that he randomly came upon two men who were selling the horse and he didn't notice that it was stolen property. Mm. Even though he had been riding with Baker just a couple of hours earlier I and mean, remember everyone knew what this horse looked like because she was, you know, unusual for the time. Whatever. It's fine. Um, and wasn't his original story that he took the horse as a form of payment because someone owed him a debt? Mm. So his story's already changed. Then he was asked about the watch, the money, and the clothes. No answer. I guess he just came upon those as well. I don't know. Weird. Weird. Okay. I've never just walked up upon a pile of money. It would be nice. I but mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna be bad and do bad things, you you can't be stupid. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not saying people go out and, and do bad things and then be smart mm-hmm. about covering up. But, I mean, come on. Don't be stupid. No. Isaac was arrested and tried for murder in, on January 31st of 1825. The case was so sensationalized that there had to be a change in venue for the trial. Ugh. The defense was worried that Isaac wouldn't get a fair trial in Maysville. His father hired the best defense attorney he could find. They presented an interesting argument for all of the circumstantial evidence. That he got amnesia. He bumped his head. The personal items that were found by Baker's body that belonged to Isaac? Obviously, they were planted. Obviously. Somebody's out to get him. Then they said, even though Baker had been stabbed, there weren't any signs of blood on the ground near the body or on the road. As for the death itself, are you ready for this one? I'm ready. You're not ready. I'm not ready. The days had been unusually warm for November. And wild boars were known to be a menace in the area. (laughs) But here's my question. If wild boars were to blame, then why did Baker's body not show any signs of being ravaged by animals when it had I'm been there for six saying, days? I'm just saying, because wild boars, they will tear a tear body up. up. Like, tear it up. I mean, have you not seen Old Yeller? Mm. Boars are absolutely insane. I'm just saying, they mm. will eat you. They will. They will eat you. So, after this wild, this wild, wild boar. Yes. Story. The like, story of the boars was which is wild. What punctured. And they are also wild. Yes. Um, the jury went to deliberate. They were barely gone an hour before coming back with a guilty verdict and death sentence. I mean, is it because they were laughing for so long? Is that why it took them that long? Because, I mean, that sounds a little crazy. <laughs> Immediately, Isaac's defense attorney appealed the verdict and sentence. The grounds of the appeal were based on jury tampering. Oh. The sheriff stayed with the jury during deliberation, and he watched over the jury. Then, a majority of the jurors received anonymous notes threatening to burn an effigy of them if they did not convict, which, for anybody who doesn't know what an effigy is, it basically just, like, looks like the person. Think of, like, a a massive voodoo doll. Yeah. And they burn it. But it's not a voodoo doll. Um, But, yeah. Don't don't make food at all. Um, that's hmm. but so to get into kind of a, a couple of things. So for those who aren't aware of what jury tampering means, because we haven't talked about jury tampering. Simply put, it is the crime of attempting to influence the decisions of a jury throughout a trial via private communication or contacting a juror regarding matters relating to the case being tried. Yes. That's bad. Don't do it. Right. So you cannot, like, the attorneys can't can't try and, like, pull a juror to the side and talk or anything. Mm-hmm. Or And actually, this happened in the Scott Peterson, Lacey Peterson case. Really? That. Because one of the jurors, they had to go through metal detectors. You know, like, when you go into the mm-hmm. courthouse, you have to go through all that. 
and a juror was coming in because they weren't sequestered, which sequestered just means that they have to like go to a hotel room at night. They can't go back to their families or anything. And I don't believe they were sequestered or anything, but they were, uh, this juror was coming into the courthouse um, and was just in line waiting to go. And the, he saw someone standing behind him or in front of him. I don't recall. And just said something like, you having a good morning. Like it was something very benign. Mm -hmm. It was Scott Peterson's brother. Oh no. And someone just saw it and out the guy got pulled off the jury. Wow. So it's, which I think was a bit ridiculous. Well, I mean, I mean, I get it. It could be like code or something like that. Like I get that, but, but it just in like passing of like, Oh, crazy morning. Right. And I think that's what it was because there were so many people outside that it was like hard to get in. And so I think he said something like crazy morning. Right. And like benign just walked in and then a juror like reported him but with it being such a A high high profile profile case Mm -hmm. i mean you know i get it i mean yeah so it was it was just it's it's insane so that's what jury tampering is as for appealing a conviction so we haven't talked about appealing convictions either so we're learning a lot about the court system hopefully i'm getting all of this right i know i know an expert i was gonna say i know I know of lawyers that listen to this podcast and attorneys, lawyers, attorneys, esquires, whatever you would like to be called. <laughs> um, so hopefully I'm getting all of this right. I did look it up. I did make sure I tried to explain it in the best. I tried to not make it legalese. Uh huh. So as for appealing a conviction, this is a request from this is a request to a higher court also called an appellate court an appellate court is always a higher court Mm -hmm. to review and change the decision of a lower court this allows the defendant to challenge the conviction or the sentence if an appeal is successful the initial charges are restored and the case will either go back to the lower court to be tried again Or in some cases, the trial would not be tried again. But basically, it just, it says like, JK, to that previous trial. It's just like, oh, undo. Like, (laughs) like you just undo something on your computer. You're like, undo. Like, click that little. And everything just goes back to the beginning. Um, That's when you would get a whole new jury. You would get a whole new, like everything. That's, um, I believe that's also when you can submit new evidence that you didn't have in the previous trial. Like you can do a lot of things like that. If it's, yeah, and this is here. If it's not tried in the lower court again, it is due to the higher court finding that there was insufficient evidence to retry the defendant. Does that make sense? Say it one more time. If if it's not tried in the lower court again, it is typically due to the higher court finding that there is insufficient evidence to retry gotcha. the defendant. Gotcha. So... Basically, the higher court is saying, one, we're appealing this. Two, you don't have what you need to do this in the first place, so you're not going to try it again. I I don't know how common that is, how uncommon that is. Um, And then, of course, if your appeal is denied, then your appeal is denied and the conviction stands. So, Sadie. Yes. So, the appeal was approved. Really? By Judge... (laughs) Leah's about... He's about to lose it by Judge George Pegleg Shannon. Uh uh-uh. uh. His nickname was George Peg, or it was a. Uh, so he was Judge Pegleg. Like oh, his nickname oh, was oh, Pegleg. Oh, did he only have one leg? Did he only have one leg? Yes. <laughs> and um, he had a peg leg. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So did he lose it in a war? I don't know. But ju- he had to have. <laughs> Judge Pegleg. His is- <laughs> name was Pegleg. <laughs> Judge Pegleg was approved. <laughs> Uh, a judge Pedleg. Judge, it's not funny. It's that not somebody easy has a peg to leg. say either. I'm sorry. It's not funny, but they called him Pegleg, y'all. Judge they peg leg. called him Pegleg. I wonder if he used. I, <gasps> <laughs> I wonder if he used. Did he have like, 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 
did he have a gavel and a foot in one? Like, was it a gavel and a foot? That's so bad. That's Sorry. so bad. That's all I could think. Of. <laughs> We ain't right. No, we never we never claimed to be honest. Oh, like, that was bad. <clears throat> but y'all, could could you imagine? <laughs> it's it's kind of like imagining the birds floating on the squirrels. Mm-hmm. It's just an yeah, image. It's, you it's, can't you once can't. it's there. It's just there. <clears throat> He's like, hold on. <laughs> like twist yeah. his robes up, getting them up. <laughs> oh, we're so bad. I'm sorry. Uh, like in the powdered <gasps> wig and everything. <laughs> oh gosh. So I told y'all we was going to lose it. Oh, um, Judge Pegleg Judge says, Pegleg. All rise for Judge Pegleg. <laughs> like, did they call him that in the court? I don't know. <laughs> but they made sure that it was very important to Wait, make to who, know it was who, Pegleg. Who's the judge? What what judge is your case going before? I oh, got Pegleg. I got, I got the Pegleg. <laughs> got old Peggy. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it I mean, so much. You're welcome. Um, they put Judge Peg. They put George Pegleg Shannon, and I knew like uh, clearly it was important because they put it in like these I mean, official documents. Like so much later, they oh, made sure gosh. that we knew that he was called Pegleg. <sighs> was there a picture? No. <sighs> This time we don't have a lot of photos uh, at this so period sad. of time. We're getting to a period where, where we're starting to get more. I want a um, picture of old Peggy. Anywho. And Peggy. <laughs> anywho. <laughs> that was beautiful. You're welcome. <laughs> that takes on a whole new meaning now. <laughs> Skylar's sisters are performing, and Angelica and Eliza are up front, and Peggy's coming behind with her peg leg, and that's why she has to say Aunt Peggy's, because she's behind. <laughs> I'm seeing a whole new scene in my mind, and we, oh, need, to, we need to recreate this. <sighs> that is... <sighs> <laughs> hey, and Peggy. <laughs> Someone please make a t shirt. <laughs> Judge Pegleg. And Peggy. And Peggy. Oh. <laughs> oh gosh, I'm sorry. I could I couldn't resist though. That was great. Um, you're welcome. Uh <laughs> <sighs> anyway, it took until September <laughs> to obtain a new jury. That hadn't heard about the case somehow. <sighs> Again, Isaac was convicted and sentenced to death. Again, the case was overturned on another technicality because the prosecution, are you ready for this? What did they come up with now, hyenas? Just wait. The prosecution failed. To state that Baker's murder took place in Fleming County like the indictment had indicated. Oh, my heavens. <laughs> so, the prosecution argued that because the change of venue had been granted, the place of the actual murder wasn't of importance. The local papers had a field day. Claiming that the trials were a farce and that they were rigged from the start... Due to Isaac's father. Well. The Winchester Gazette said. Quote. It would seem that justice had either bid adieu to Kentucky. Or that her judges are the most corrupt and desperate men living. Oh. Well, they're down. some strong words. They're down a leg. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Took, knocked him down a peg. <laughs> oh. No. <laughs> you are on a roll. I know. Look. <clears throat> Sorry. Oh, it's getting late. We're we're, we're recording later. Yeah, than we normal. are. Um, so it took until February of 1826 to pick another jury for a third trial. Y'all, he clearly did this, and he was not smart about it. Would you like to guess what happened? He was convicted and he sentenced had, he, and sentenced to death. You were correct. Ding, 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 ding. So this is a bit of a... Okay. This is a trigger warning. Um, 
if one, I really didn't care to read about this, so I really don't really want to say, but it it's important to the case uh, and mm-hmm. important to the story. So I do have to discuss it. Um, also, it it involves discussion of suicide. So if you don't want to hear that as well, um, but it's also just gross. Like, I'm sorry. Um, he, he is alive cause he didn't pass away at this time. Mm-hmm. But so a trigger warning, if you don't want to hear that and, and just trust me that if you were at all squeamish, skip ahead, like just trust me. Um, five months later, Isaac attempted to complete suicide in his cell by slitting his throat. His attempt was nearly completed, but the surgeon made it to him in time. During the surgery, the doctor inserted a silver tube to reinforce his severed windpipe. Yuck. Isaac would only be able to speak in a whisper, and the tube had to be regularly removed to be cleaned and reinserted. Each time this happened, Isaac said it felt like he was being suffocated. Well, I that mean, is disgusting. That's disgusting. And I hate that he had to go through that. That is terrible. Yes. I, I mean, it is terrible. It, it, that but is it's bad. just, it's just gross. Um, you know what? He's a little weasel. Well, his conviction was appealed again. <sighs> I mean, here's the thing. I think. That dad's the one that's in charge of all this. Isaac's like, hey, dad, I did this junk. I'm we'll, miserable. We'll get there. We'll get there. His dad doesn't have too much to do with any of it right now. Mm. Okay. So his conviction was appealed again. And due to Isaac's poor health, the doctor signed an order stating that keeping Isaac in jail was endangering his life. Isaac was released on bond pending the approval of the appeal. It was over a year after the third appeal had taken place in March of 1827 that defense attorneys tried to have the case dismissed altogether on procedural grounds. The request was denied. They filed for dismissal again in June, stating that the court had failed to seat a full panel of impartial jurors. Denied again. Well, both of these requests kind of poked to the bear, per se. And the court decided that Isaac was healthy enough to withstand jail, and he was taken back into custody instead of being out on bond. This is where the second controversy of Governor Joseph Desha comes in. On the same day the court tried to put Isaac back in jail, the governor stood up in the courtroom and issued his son an unconditional pardon. <sighs> this, I put, this was not good for old Governor Joey. I mean, wow. Some say that he resigned as governor immediately. But, according to official records, he did serve the rest of his political term. He never inserted himself into politics again. He retired to his farm. And he died in 1824. But that is the second controversy is he issued his son an unconditional pardon. When everybody knew he did it. Yeah. It was obvious he did it. Right. Oh, I mean, I understand that you love your son. And it's hard to think for. I mean, I have nephews and nieces and I would hate to think anything Mm But negative, that's but bad. That's, that's, bad. that's bad. I mean, and it's obvious that he did it. Mm-hmm. That's what's that. That's what got. It. I mean, it's very obvious. Yeah. Um, Isaac left Kentucky after his pardon and traveled down the Mississippi River. He allegedly tried to attempt to rob a flatboat near Vicksburg, Mississippi, but the skipper on the boat knew Isaac. <laughs> I mean, he just got a pardon and asked why Isaac was trying to rob him. Uh, Isaac confessed of his, you know, misfortunes of living on the run since his pardon. The skipper convinced Isaac to try and turn over a new leaf and said he would give him a ride to New Orleans. Isaac agreed and accepted the ride. Before he left the skipper, he said that he planned to travel far away, change his name and have a fresh start. 
Once in New Orleans, he changed his name to John Parker. He met a man from Ohio named Thomas Early, who was traveling to Texas. Isaac noticed that Early had quite a bit of money on him. Uh oh. And once Early reached Texas, he planned on buying several mules and horses and taking them back to Ohio. Isaac decided to join Early, and once in San Felipe de Austin, the two left on horseback going to San Antonio. But once Isaac reached Gonzales, he was by himself. Mm. He continued to San Antonio and lost quite a bit of his newly acquired money gambling. He headed back to San Felipe, and once he arrived, suspicions arose that Isaac had something to do with the disappearance of Early. A few days after, Early's clothes were found in a creek nearby, and then they found scattered skeletal remains. Then a weird thing happened. Oh, dear. Remember I told you they're twists and turns? Yeah. A man living in San Felipe named Thomas Duke Marshall noticed the man going by John Parker. This man just happened to be the nephew of Chief Justice John Marshall, who was the fourth Chief Justice of the U.S. from 1801 to 1835. Served a long time, 34 years. And he was from Kentucky. Oh, no. Young Marshall also noticed that the man he recognized happened to be breathing through a silver tube and couldn't speak over a whisper. (gasps) Oh, yeah. So now you see why I had to put that in. (laughs) Because I didn't want to, but I had to. Oh, because he still had to take that thing out. I'll come back to that as well. Um, he confronted Isaac and Isaac made a full confession. Hmm. He admitted he was using a false identity and that he murdered Thomas early. There wasn't a jail in San Felipe. So the local blacksmith said he could construct irons to restrain Isaac until the trial. The trial for the murder of Thomas early was set for August 14th of 1828. But the day before the trial, Isaac Desha died of a fever. After his death, a legend arose that he, in fact, hadn't died. And that his funeral was staged. He actually escaped to Hawaii, married a native woman, and fathered several children with her. In 1956, Andrew Forrest Muir was uh, writing, and he was studying the... Filson Club History Quarterly, whatever that is. But he debunked this legend. He documented that the first Deshes in Hawaii did not arrive until nearly two decades after Isaac Desha's death. The Desha in Hawaii was John Langhern Desha, who was actually the grandson of of Joseph Desha and the nephew of Isaac. Ah. This Desha was extremely respectable, and he helped establish Queen's Hospital. Okay. Which is actually, back then, I believe it was the Queen's Medical Center, which is the largest nonprofit hospital in Honolulu, Hawaii, and he worked at the hospital until his death. So. While there were Deshes that moved there and they were related, it was not, it had nothing to do with Isaac. And it was a, quite a while after. Yeah. I mean, he had 12 siblings, so there's no time. I mean, you know, he um, had a few, a couple of relations. Few. Few. So that is the story of Isaac Desha. So probably the, in, the fever came from an infection from, from the, tube. the tube. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. because it said he had he either had to remove it or he had to have it removed i don't remember what i put for that um because that that would matter it just said that the tube had to regularly be removed cleaned and reinserted so either way if he was doing it himself i mean you're traveling where are you gonna clean it yeah how are you gonna sterilize that yeah so that's what i think i think that that 
that so tube got infected. So he probably kind of knew that was happening so he confessed. He's like, I mean, I'm about to die anyway. I don't know. I, I think probably so. I bet he knew. I think it's a possibility. But yeah, I think that's I think that's eventually how he died. He just got an infection somewhere in his body. I mean, that thing's in your throat. I mean, what are you? Mm. Um, oh, here's a fun would you rather. I don't know. I don't I don't probably neither. <laughs> would you rather have a silver tube that you can only speak above a whisper? Or a peg leg. <laughs> I mean, I already fall with two working legs. Let's just say peg leg. <laughs> hey, it could be it could be useful. You never know. You could be a pirate. Arr. I mean, it, it would. Hey, um, I I probably would go with peg leg too. Yes, so. because I like to sing. Yeah, that the whole. And that the just, and the tube and the having to pull. I mean, I've never been intubated or anything like that. I just I'm that weirds me out. I mean, I've had endoscopy. I've never but I'm, had anything. But I'm asleep. Yeah. So I don't. You know. But I've never had any of those things. I mean, I've had a mole taken off of my head, mm-hmm. and that was local anesthetic. Oof. That's it. Yeah. That's all. Never had a That's tooth. A good, that was taken a long out. process. Ugh, five years ago. Yeah, I know. I remember. Mm, it's rough um we have a website we do where you can find any and all onuc information you are looking for it is one nation under crime.com yes we are one nation under crime on facebook instagram and youtube and mm-hmm. at onuc pod on twitter i'm on twitter a pretty good bit guys so come, she is come join us on twitter and we can talk we can chat let me know If you love our podcast as much as we do, and we know that you do, please follow us, subscribe, do whatever it is, recommend us Mm -hmm. to your friends and family. Um, Strangers in the mm -hmm. waiting room. Always. Um, And if you feel like it, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. As I said before, five stars only. We only accept perfection here. And if you have nothing nice to say, then don't say anything at all. I mean, you know, um, we might might take a four. I'm not taking four. four. Um, Perfection or nothing. Um, We do have a Patreon if you would like to help with the cost of making and hosting the show. Also, uh, like we said before, the USBS episodes that are coming out, they are coming out from now until the end of the year. But, however, they will move to Patreon starting January 2022. And we won't do one every week then. um, But the episodes that come out for the month of December will still remain on the normal feed. Um, just any future episodes will move over to uh, We'd like Patreon. to give you a little taste. Let's yes. just let you see what, what will be coming to you. And there are some pretty fun tiers uh, as far as Patreon goes that you can join. They have fun little names that I came up with. So oh dear. it's very, it, it's fun. You get to decide, uh, you get to decide where your loyalties lie. We'll say that. Ooh. You can be, a founding father mm. you can be a patriot or you can be a loyalist very fun they're all different tiers so and on there it describes like what each tier includes like all that kind of stuff so go there just go to patreon search for one nation under crime we appreciate you guys listening to this week's very episode much. um i hope you enjoyed it it's a very interesting episode to research a lot of information um so we will see you here same time different crime next week and peggy (laughs) (laughs) and remember (laughs) there isn't always liberty and justice for all unless you're the one with the peg leg that's banging the gavel goodbye (laughs) bye